Si no hay un lanzamiento. Sí. Hola, buenas a todos eh, a esta charla Rearticulando Cuba del proyecto independiente a la nación como DAO. Esta es la charla o el eh, conversatorio de clausura de esta serie que eh, hemos venido realizando desde hace 10 días. Eh, hoy tenemos unos invitados de lujo. Eh, desde México está el filósofo, historiador y politólogo, ensayista, miembro numerario de la Academia Mexicana de la, de la, de la Historia y profesor e investigador del Centro de Estudios Históricos del Colegio de México, Rafael Roja, también autor de una veintena de títulos y experto en historia intelectual y política de América Latina. Desde Cuba está Dagoberto Valdés, que es un prominente intelectual católico cubano, ensayista y líder cívico. Dagoberto ha sido director del Centro de Formación Cívico-Religiosa de Pinar del Río, de ahí de su revista vitral, y en estos momentos del Centro de Estudios Convivencia, un think tank sobre ciudadanía. Eh, Dagoberto es un experto en sociedad civil y educación cívica en Cuba, y es autor también de una docena de títulos. Y aquí me acompaña desde acá Tania Bruguera, que es una importante artista visual, eh, multidisciplinar y activista, fundadora de la Cátedra Arte Conducta, que es el primer programa de estudios performáticos en América Latina, y también de INSTAR, la institución que nos está acogiendo en esta charla, eh, invitada a Documenta. Tania es también profesora o ha sido profesora de la Universidad de Chicago y en estos momentos es profesora de la Universidad de Harvard en Estados Unidos. Y para comenzar entonces, después de esta eh, bienvenida a ustedes, que este es un conversatorio de lujo, ojalá que se pueda repetir todos los días y en una Cuba del futuro mucho más, va a ser muy necesario el aporte de todos ustedes. Yo quería lanzar una pregunta así al Pairo, y la primera es posible desde el punto de vista de la praxis politológica y de la historia, de lo que nos ha, hemos visto en la historia, crear una Cuba from scratch, Is it possible to imagine a Cuba from scratch, a Cuba where we all have a place, a Cuba in which we could all play a role in order to create a truly inclusive nature and avoid the mistakes of the past? Dago, since you're in Cuba, maybe you should go first because we always run the risk of the communication being interrupted. Thank you. It's an honor for me and a pleasure to be part of this panel as part of this important exhibition, Documenta. As you were reading your question, Hochi, I said to myself, actually, this is a question for Rafa. Is it possible from the point of view of historiography, etc.? I will speak from the point of view of Cuba's civil society, the one living in the island and the one who's living in the diaspora, which we must always uh, take into consideration. This panel is a, an example of that. Rafa, Tania, and me, we prove that Cuba breathes through tr two lungs. Now your question is, is it possible? I think that it is possible. In fact, I am in Cuba and I have, it, I have been involved for over 30 years in a pedagogical project directed at reconstructing civil society. And this is because I believe and I think that it is socially and politically possible. I think that every nation is capable of rebuilding itself. This, is, this I believe in principle. Nonetheless, I think that Cuba, it doesn't only have possibilities, it only has a reservoir. It has moral resources and historical resources, philosophical resources and political resources. And it's a kind of like a treasure that we must use, I believe, as a point of departure to guarantee said reconstruction. I will mention a few of them. The first of them is our history. If we compare 
Well, I am delving into Rafa's territory, so hopefully he will correct me, but I will share my own vision. In comparison with uh, Latin America and other regions of the world, Cuba has a history that undoubtedly offer many potentialities for it. I want to refer to the Varela Marti project. These are two pillars from the point of view of our moral reservoir these are available resources that allow us to drink from the root to drink from our own well as our friend gustavo gutierrez would say i mean that in the well of cuban culture we have the first reason to think that it is possible to rebuild a nation with all or for the good of all. Whenever we discuss this, we need to return to the source, to the root. I, all, I don't even like the root returning to, going back to. No, I think it would rather be to step forward towards or to envision, as people say now, to look into the future because Medardo Vitier would also say those seeds that were planted in the 19th century in Cuba, they retain their seminal power. This is a first possibility of reconstruction. Another one is that in spite of the fact that all Cubans have endured an anthropological damage as the result of the totalitarian regime, in spite of this human damage, I believe that the ethos of the Cuban nation, both on the island and abroad, retains a yearning, an aspiration, not only political, but a humanistic aspiration. And this is, let's say, the key to the national secret. We are a deeply humanistic nation. And whatever has a humanistic dimension carries a potential for reconstruction, resurrection, and rebuilding towards the future. So it's a historical legacy. It's a humanistic patrimony that is current. The son of the moral world that VTA used to talk about. And I also believe, and I think it's plausible to mention, to mention this as a possibility of recovery, is we have a kind of uh, religiosity or spirituality. I'm not speaking from the point of view of any particular religious denomination. But undoubtedly, I think that even in Cuba's contemporary condition, in spite of the predominance of uh, secularity, there is another form of spirituality which unifies the human person, which traverses uh, history, philosophy, and the humanities. And this religiosity, I think that is also another possibility for the reconstruction of Cuba. So um, we should have confidence in human improvement. Again, we're not only going back to, but we are moving forward towards Varela's and Marti's thought. And I personally believe in this human improvement. Rafa, would you like to add something to this? Obviously, this is your subject matter. Thank you, Joaquin, for the, your introduction and for inviting me. 
to be part of this conversation with Dagoberto Valdez and Tania Bruguera. I admire both of them. They're aware of this. And I have also written about them as an intellectual and scholar, and I also in my public interventions. It's an extremely relevant question, and my answer, like Dago's, is affirmative. I do think that it is possible to build uh, an extremely inclusive nation. I wouldn't say, I wouldn't dare to call it absolutely inclusive because this is an ideal that has not been fulfilled in the history of Cuba, but also in global and Latin American history. Like other Latin American and Caribbean nations, Cuba has never been completely inclusive. Let's remember that during the 19th century, we suffered the institution of slavery, characteristic of a regime based on social exclusion. Women were also deprived of the right to vote. So in terms of civil rights, political rights, social rights, there is, there is always a limit and a deficit in the experience of modernity as such. Now we should say, and I also agree with Dago here, after the Cuban revolution, we have reached a form of exclusion that we had, had never been experienced before. I would dare say that no other country in the region has experienced anything similar. The construction of a kind of regime that is very similar to the regimes of uh, real socialism in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, and which correspond to the structure of communist totalitarianisms of the 20th century. These kinds of regimes produce a very uncommon form of exclusion, which is exclusion based on a state ideology. So I would say that the experience of the 19th century and the first Republican half of the 20th century and of the history of Cuba under the revolution thus far easily leads to the conclusion that a nation with a high degree of social inclusion could only be built on the basis of a democratic pact not under this or that ideology of the state. In Latin American cases, unlike our own, during the 19th century, many of these nations expected to be built on the basis of liberalism, the classical liberal state. You had a repertoire of civil rights, political rights, social rights, and economic rights. It was much more limited than it is now. These are the what are known as the first generation rights, basic rights. But we know that a majority of Latin American countries embraced this model of uh, individualistic uh, citizenship. And this created a great degree of segregation. Central American countries and countries in the Andean region, for example, excluded indigenous communities. The other model that is very uh, nation building model that is very common in Latin America since the 19th century is what we could define as the Republican model. But like the liberal model, it is, it's extremely individualistic. It's based on the individual as a citizen and owner. Instead, I'm sorry, the Republican model is based on a different model based on community. As Dago said, Cuba's strongest intellectual tradition is Republican rather than liberal. The tradition that harks back to Martí, Heredia, Varela, and other 19th century thinkers. Of course, there is a liberal branch, but I feel that it was never as magnetic in Cuba's political culture as the Republican tradition. 
Now, our Republican experience during the first half of the 20th century proves that there are also many mechanisms of social exclusion within Republican models. So in the 21st century, democracy would have to be the point of departure for an, the reconstruction of the nation as an inclusive nation, and which should also review earlier ideological models. It will not do to return to the liberal or the Republican model. The 21st century has presented us with unheard of developments in terms of uh, rights, for example, the rights of non-traditional families, the rights of Afro-descendant communities, the rights uh, of alternative forms of organizing the family and other social sectors, what used to be called what used to be called the rights of minorities, no longer so called. And we must add new kinds of rights, what are known as third and fourth generation rights, environmental rights, for example. So this is the kind of redesign of the nation that we would have to undertake, bearing in mind the complexities of the 21st century. Unfortunately, the last constitution, constitutional effort in Cuba is, uh, is uh, far behind in terms of these requirements. I'm talking about the 2019 constitution. We know it and we know how its limitations, of course. Tania, what is INSTARS and your position on this issue? You and Dago, Rafael is more of a scholar, but you and Dago had led institutions intended to encourage the emergence of civil society, especially Dago's first project, Centro de Formación Cívico-Religiosa, because his current project, Convivencia, functions more as a think tank. What is your vision and what is INSTAR's vision regarding national reconstruction? Well, first of all, I, I want to say that I'm extremely honored to be here with you. My old teacher, Rafa, and my great friend, Dago, and you, I think that INSTAR is betting on, let's say, the ethical dimension and the emotional dimension during such a kind of transition towards a new society. Bearing in mind that before we get there, we will go through very difficult moments and perhaps art will be helpful in mediating as we engage in difficult conversations and debates and emotions that are unresolved. So art could be a kind of tool to during uh, spaces that where there will be confrontation and pain. I used to, at points, I would think that Cuba could not possibly be remade, but uh, recent events like July 11th and the San Isidro movement, they have taught us that although people are keeping quiet, not only do they think that it is possible to make another Cuba, but they are wanting another Cuba to exist already, right? So we have put a lot of uh, thought into this in Instar and we've speculated. And so we agree with Dago's and Rafa's positions, but I also think that it would be interesting, first of all, to base this society on a fair, a just humanism and a relationship between ethics and well-being. And also, as Rafa said, to examine not only the models that he mentioned, 
or logical models like the fall of the socialist field and what happened afterwards, we should also start thinking from the point of view of the 21st century. I think that one of the problems of Diaz Camel's government is that they think from the point of view of the 20th century, the continuity that he often speaks of, it's not just a turn of phrase, it's an ex a manifestation of the fact that they are afraid of entering the 21st century, which carries very deep challenges. There is the need to reconstruct an imaginary, not just a society, but its perception of itself and as in, and also as individuals. And we mustn't be afraid of that. I think that the people are ready to confront that kind of experimentation, right? It's true that Cuba is, uh, in a sense, lagging behind its a worldview and its political models come from the 20th century and it seems to be still stuck in the mentality of the Cold War. And so new challenges that are coming up today, including civilian reclamations. I mean, when you did your when we were at the Ministry of Culture or during July 11th, I saw that it, I saw a population that seems to have uh, been driven by reclamations that they had seen elsewhere in the world. They didn't realize that they were confronting a dictatorship. It's as if they thought that this was a government that they could place demands on. But the government understands this as a challenge, and it's uh, following the model of uh, socialist Eastern European countries. I think that maybe the sad moment of today's Cuba is that in the 20th century, with the revolution, it was a place of uh, avant-garde, and it is now a place where the future is being obstructed. I think that maybe this is the tra tragedy that we are going through in Cuba. Society wants to go forward, and they don't know how to. The, uh, the structure is completely obsolete and arthritic. Rafa, maybe I would like to ask you this question first. The socialist model presents the dictatorship of the proletariat as a democratic alternative. It's based on the assumption that the power is placed in the people's hands. And But the idea is that any political model could be democratic, so even the dictatorship of the proletariat could also be democratic, and that form of government could be horizontal. Do you think that democracy is the sole possible social contract, the sole possible form of government in the 21st century, or the one that is more just? Do you think that it, democracy is unidimensional or can it be applied to structures of government that are not are not, not those of free the free trade or well I think I I already said something about it when I spoke earlier. I do think that we need to first of all acknowledge that it is a fallacy to, to present as democratic re regimes that negate democracy. There are many kinds of anti-democratic regimes in the world and in, in our recent experience worldwide. But we might simplify a bit and say that there are two totalitarian regimes and authoritarian regimes. In Cuba's ideological background, there are two platforms which gravitate toward one or the other of these two models. The doctrinal platform of Marxism-Leninism, right? You said you, you talked about the dictatorship of the proletariat. But there is another pole, 
you mentioned the concept of the people. On the other hand, there is revolutionary nationalism. And like populism, this is a, a tool more common to authoritarianism. And I think that Cuba's model is constantly moving between one or, and the other of these two poles. Although the access of its power structure remains steady. So during the past uh, few years, and especially in the 2019 constitution, we see this. So in principle, I would say that, yes, the sole path in the history of the hemisphere, it's very clear in the last 30 years, the sole path for progress toward uh, uh, a wide endowment of rights, democratic and civil, is the framework of a constitutional democracy. So it was someone mentioned earlier that Cuba is somewhat out of place in the hemisphere, and this is uh, an example because even left-leaning governments in Latin America, they start from a clear embrace of the democratic constitutional framework. And this is not clear in Cuba at all. In fact, the last con constitution adapts anti-democratic forms and dresses them up in the language of rights. But the interpretation is either authoritarian or totalitarian. The Cuban regime is gradually becoming a hybrid not democratic totalitarian, but rather in its core, it remains totalitarian, but it incorporates some authoritarian variants. Dago, bueno, si quieres comentar algo sobre esta pregunta, Dago, would you comment on this question? I would maybe like you to connect this with uh, an idea that you have expressed before, for example, yesterday in our conversation. You have said that if democracy is the sole possible social pact for a modern nation, you have uh, mentioned the idea that civil society is the new name of democracy. Tell us a little bit about this. Do you regard civil society as the protagonist of any modern nation? Yes, in principle, I agree with what Rafa has just said, but I would like us to dwell on the term democracy. I mean, lately some scholars have been talking about what they call a quality democracy, right? Democracy is the term that has had the most uh, last names. But I agree with the idea that we must look for a democratic model, model that is good, has a good quality. How do we evaluate its quality? Not just inclusion, there is also the philosophy on which it is based, the overcoming of the defects of earlier forms of democracy, because precisely we should Bear in mind during the reconstruction of Cuba is that authoritarianism and totalitarianism, they take advantage of the deficits of the democratic model. I mean, when institutions don't function appropriately, when the democratic model becomes a formal representation and not a functional one, when democracies serve the rule of the parties and not the society of which they are public servants, then you get messianic movements, people who say these institutions don't work, the parties are obsolete, we need a direct democracy. And this is when you have a salvation by a leader or a messiah who says, we will fix these democracies. So we have to maintain a good democracy. And this is the first way to make sure that we, our democratic model will not have such deficits or gaps. 
of course, you will always have some. As Churchill said, democracy is the worst of all systems with the exception of all others. I have actually written a book on this topic. It's called Rebuilding or Reconstructing Civil Society, a project for Cuba. I don't know if Rafa remembers this. I do believe that civil society is the new name of modern democracies. My reason for saying this is not that I want to change the position of civil society. The state, the modern state, I mean, has a function that cannot be performed by anyone else. But the question is, who serves who? And this is one of the steps that the church has taken forward in its social doctrine. One of the advances that we have taken with respect to the Second Vatican, Vatican Council is that one of the chapters which I contributed to writing establishes that the civil community must be at the service of civil society. This is, I believe, a basic principle. Secondly, a transition from a society organized around an ideology, from ideology to humanism, a transition from ideology to humanism. And here, I insist, there is a cultural and political legacy in Cuba. The legacy of Varela and Martí contains all possibilities. We don't need to go anywhere else to look for the resources that will allow us to build Cuba in the 21st century, because in my opinion, humanism is the step towards which civil society must head after the hegemony of ideologies. And what is a humanist democracy? Well, a democracy that holds the human person as the primacy of society. It's true that the 20th century debated between economic or liberal hegemony or political or authoritarian hegemony. I think it is time for a model in which the human person is the fundamental and sole value of all members of a nation. In the Middle Ages, it was God. Then it was, well, a humanism that was very narrow. Tania has just said that Instar wants to focus on the cultivation of the emotions and beauty. Well, a democratic model for the 21st century would be a humanist democracy in which personalism, as described by Emmanuel Mounier, communitary personalism, so not the individual, but the person as part of civil society and its participatory fabric. And here, we, we will heal the anthropological damage endured by people in Cuba by dealing with all of these dimensions, emotional, will, transcendence, and anthropological reconstruction, which Pope Francis calls an anthropological conversion. This could be a philosophical basis for Cuban democracy, and this will again enact a triple alliance between truth, beauty, and goodness. The search for the truth, 
the cultivation of beauty and the enactment ethics based on the goodwill of people. So I think that we already have a think tank. I'm not talking about any particular project, but a kind of a intellectual evolution during the 21st century. We are confronting challenges like the fourth industrial revolution and also challenges proper to our societies, which, you know, they look for new ideologies falling into a kind of a remake of failed democracies. So we need to overcome ideologies, cultivate all dimensions of the human person and civil society as the workshop of democracy, as the seedbed of democracy, because you cannot participate in society without having first experienced participation as part of a small group, a community, your place of work or of study. So we believe that indeed our future democracy should have two fundamental pillars the cult among Cubans to the full dignity of uh, human persons. You see that Munier's thought is in perfect uh, sync with Marti's thought. So one pillar is the human person, and the second pillar is civil society as the workshop of democracy. Well, I'm the youngest person in the group, and I am perhaps the most realist and the least hopeful among the three of us. But first of all, democracies have uh, become into an impeded exercise. So nowadays, many totalitarianisms in the world use the word democracy, but they are truly autocracies. So I think that democracy as a model is also to some extent in crisis. I'm not saying that I want an unprotected society or a society that is out of balance. I would like a society where all persons are covered, and as you have said, this would be a responsible state. But I also think that we should find the meaning of democracy again in Cuba and not use it as a formula, as, a, as the current government does, or as a word. Unfortunately, there is enormous anthropological damage in Cuba. And this means that it, may, it might even take one or two generations before we reach the Cuba we want, because current generations are maybe extremely damaged. And the seat is perhaps their way of being in the world. You know, there are many emotions and elements during the last few years of the so-called revolution are really fateful attempts to enact democracy. I have been part of a process that is entirely horizontal with 27N, and then the people have taken over. But we have seen examples that show that nonetheless there is a tradition Cuba has spent more time under dictatorship than under the rule of law. So I think that there is a, a phantom. We are always looking for a strong man or a supreme leader. Unfortunately, it's always a man, right? A messiah. And we see this even in social media, 
This could be one of the portals through which people are starting to construct certain democratic elements and spaces of discussion, but you will always uh, have someone who writes you and asks, when are you going to save us? They're looking for a Messiah, right? I think that we need, first of all, to do away, get rid of this feeling that somebody is going to come save us. The people can save itself by exerting its right to demand its rights. I want to emphasize two points you have made. Sometimes we focus on what has happened since 1959, but Cuba has been under dictatorship or tyranny for 70 years. And this, of course, creates an extreme anthropological deformation. This country has lived through all types of authoritarian models. Power models have been inha inherited. We have had puppet governments. So, of course, we have to take this into consideration. Here we are tearing down myths, and one of these myths is the notion that a dictatorship, communist or Marxist dictatorship, could be democratic, or the myth that there could be a democratic form of government within an authoritarian model. I wanted to return to something we have talked about earlier. Somebody said that democracy has many last names. Right now, we are living through a crisis of so-called representative democracy. People have now quick access to information and don't feel the need for intermediaries. And yet we know that, let's say, a citizen cannot walk into a parliament and discuss matters of state, even if they have the right to vote, etc. But there is something about representative democracy, as we know it, that we want to change, because we are basically coming to realize that they are being used by populist governments to take control of power and to take over the structure of nations. I wanted to ask Rafa, I know that you have, it, you have been researching mourning and populism in Latin America, and not only in Latin America, we see that populism is reaching power through democratic votes everywhere in the world. And of course, this is nothing new. Hitler came to power through vote. Is this an intrinsic factor in representative democracy? It's a great question, but before I want to make two remarks. First, I want to recall uh, that Dagoberto's approach to the theory of civil society from the point of view of the social doctrine of the Catholic Church, that's very important. He has quoted Emmanuel Mounier, and in his own uh, studies, he refers to other authors from the Christian tradition, specifically the Catholic tradition. And I wanted to recall that I, I think it, his work was very refreshing, as well as the texts by other, because these writings destabilized a kind of like a unique matrix for discussing these issues in Cuba, where the sources were always Hegel, Marx, and Gramsci. That was a genealogy with the sole available framework for thinking civil society, and they agreed that under socialism, civil society could have a relative autonomy, but they always regarded civil society as subordinated to the state. 
there as an appendix of the state, as in Hegel thought, or, or to conceive it as a kind of like as an embryo, as the source through which, as in Gramsci's thought, so civil society is the source out of which state structures are constructed. So Dagoberto's effort to introduce a different approach to these theories alongside other scholars who have lately contributed, like Belia Cecilia Gomez. So they have uh, opened up a theoretical horizon that is rarely discussed in uh, official scholarly work. It's as though thought about civil society had ended with uh, Gramsci and his prison notebooks, but recently there is a theoretic, theoretical uh, revolution around this concept. Many authors have tried to think civil society in a context of diversification and pluralization, which uh, our contemporary societies are experiencing. Now, as to democracy, I think we all agree in this, that there is a strong anti-democratic political culture in Cuba, whether from a totalitarian point of view or from an authoritarian point of view. Either of these two branches are strongly anti-democratic. And this, this coincides with the emergence of new actors and voices that are pro-democratic. As Tanya was saying, in social media, you find both things and it's hard to tell them apart from each other. We do need to be careful with the concept of democracy because it's a set of norms, laws, and institutions that determine a political regime. I don't like to call it a form of government because forms of government are republics, monarchies, it's something else. But this is a kind of political regime that to some degree allows it to be distinguished from authoritarianism and totalitarianism. If we understand democracy in the old style as the government of the people, we have not made much way in that direction. And this is, of course, what Joaquin, Joaquin's question is about. Authoritarianisms take advantage of some elements of democracy to take control. For example, some contemporary political scientists claim that authoritarian and populist regimes they are competitive in an electoral context. As you know, Chavez won all of the elections and referendums in Venezuela. So this shows that democratic tools can be used to construct an autocratic uh, regime. So left-wing, right-wing populisms both proceed this way. They are creating they have the ability to compete in a democratic contest. When do you go from a democratic framework to an authoritarian framework? Well, when other components of democracy cease to function. Of course, it seems easy, for example, to use the party system to create an authoritarian regime this uh, allows authoritarianism to emerge and, of course, the crisis of democracies plays a role. We must say that everywhere in the world we are going through changes in democratic regimes and these changes are attempts to overcome these limitations. Direct democracy, like for example, direct referendums, law initiatives, for example, a, me a mechanism of direct democracy like the Proyecto Varela in the case of Cuba, 
Of course, the government canceled the possibility. And now for the first time, they are introducing a mechanism of true direct democracy, namely the referendum about family law. But in the case of Cuba, a clear indication is that it is an anti-democratic regime is that there are very few appeals to direct democracy. In Latin America, we have countries that are constantly calling for referendums, for example, Uruguay, Chile, even left-wing countries like Ecuador and Bolivia are constantly doing this. So in the 21st century, democracy can no longer be simply referred to as the rule of a party system or participate or representative democracy. We have other mechanisms. And as Doug said, we have other ways of understanding democracy, um, democracy on the ground from the point of view of civil society and the communities. I want to make a small observation. There is so much despair among the Cuban people. I think that people, and I agree with Dago here, they see democracy as the salvation, but they only see democracy as the availability of certain freedoms or liberties, but they don't see it as the source of regulations required for those liberties or freedoms to exist. I think that in Cuba, uh, we might have a difficult moment when people, after somebody says we have freedom of the press, we have freedom of expression, we have political freedoms, there will come a moment when you have to start to tell them, okay, institutions must be regulated, the state must be regulated. And I think that this will be an interesting moment and people will have to understand that in order to enjoy their freedoms, there must be some social regulation. Yes, this is what happened in Eastern Europe. They understood democracy as a form of salvation and they mistook a transition to democracy with a revolution. And here the problems start. And many of the problems that are taking place in Eastern Europe today have to do with this uh, triumphalist mistake. Hochi, I would also like to add an observation, perhaps the strategies that we could use to prevent this from happening in future democratic models for Cuba. We at Convivencia, we have often remarked three aspects that I think that we think should be prioritized. The first, institutions. Of course, when you have an electoral competition, when populists can use those, they skip over institutions or they control them. So a first remedy, so to speak, would be to protect institutions, to protect democratic institutions through a constitutional covenant, of course. But the idea is that it should be impossible to seize control of the institutions, because if there are no institutions, there are no, there can be no country. So we need to strengthen respect and constitutionally protect institutions so that they cannot be dismantled or controlled by a single form of thought. The second remedy, so to speak, is a structure of accountability. 
We should establish also through a constitutional covenant a national system of accountability for all institutions. And this agrees with the previous point. Yes, you can safeguard, protect institutions, but they could also rot from the inside through corruption, one of the enemies of democracy. So to safeguard, protect institutions from corruption, accountability at all levels of society, a culture of accountability, let's put it that way. And the third element is the one Rafa just mentioned specific practices of direct democracy. None of these three remedies works on its own. There must be a political synergy between safeguarding of institutions to prevent any assault, and I use the verb assault not to be dramatic, because we see that this happens. They, they are elected into power, and then they go to for the parliamentary branch of power, the judicial branch of power, and before you know it, they are all controlled by the same side. Second, transversal accountability. You cannot have a single institution or agency or even an organization of civil society. Of course, we have to see how accountability can be enforced without impacting personal liberties. And thirdly, the exercise of direct democracy. Also, in response to what Tania said, it's true that Eastern European countries, they wanted freedom. I've written a book called Freedom and Responsibility. This is to say that a key element in the reconstruction of Cuba is that democracy is and must be an exercise in responsibility. If you don't have responsibility among citizens, there can be no democracy. And this is why ethical and civic education is so important. Giselle Jamison, I think is her name, she has published a paper where she analyzes why economic transformations do not lead to political transformations in some countries. And she concludes that the, the hinge that prevents political reform after economic reforms is the lack of civic education and of a responsibility among the that country's population. So I want to underline that we urgently need civic education in Cuba to increase the levels of democratic responsibility. I agree with both of you, but there is some, an, something that worries me, which is what is what the people call fraudulent change. This worries me because I think that people so badly want to see change in Cuba that, I mean, we need to be patient. And this patience is being constantly many people do to, because of their whatever interests they might have are uh, preventing are altering this patience, let's say. So what, what we're calling fraudulent change is 
you know, the regime itself uses strategies, social, political strategies that resemble change, but there is actually no such change and the same people are in power. This, I'm very scared of this. What will we do? I mean, maybe, you know, it's like there being change without responsibility, right? And it's not about looking for who's guilty or cutting off anyone's head, but we want to have responsibility as an exercise in citizenship so that people will understand that to, to lead a country is not something that you do for your own benefit, but for the benefit of others, that it is a service. So this worries me, and I don't know what will happen. In Cuba, people are now starting to sell islands from the archipelago. They just gave uh, a company from the Arab Peninsula permission to carry out uh, economic transactions in Cuba, Canada. A Canadian company purchased, I don't know, they called it a sale. Since there is no institutional transparency in Cuba, you know, we really need to insist on there being institutional transparency as we engage in the process of change. So you don't know what is happening. When you watch the news, you get the feeling that they are not real news and you have to guess what is happening behind. But it feels like they're selling off the country, basically. They are also, once again, getting into debt with countries like Russia, and we don't know what they are promising in our name. The other day, I was talking to an artist who is participating here in Documenta. He's from Budapest, and he was saying to me, Anya, the saddest part, we reached that moment of change, we had many plans, we were very excited, and when we, when we got to power, we found that the country had been sold. It wasn't only bankrupt, it was indebted exorbitantly with corporations and other governments. So he was saying we couldn't get anything done, we couldn't rebuild because these people had sold it all and they had settled the future of the country before leaving. So this worries me a bit. How can we prevent this from happening? Although we have no power, because we have no power at all. We have the power of word, we have the power of presence, but not, not much more than that. This is important because a transition towards a future that is already under some kind of embargo is hard. It's a as it happened in Haiti, you reach independence, but there is a burden of debt that the country cannot confront towards the future, and they are compelled, forced to continue getting further into debt to stay afloat. And this is not just a financial debt. I think, for example, that we need to get away from this dichotomy, democracy versus autonomy. We have the idea that we will only be democratic if we become partners with the United States. If the United States begins to open up, then Europe rushes to see what they can grab. So, you know, we have the feeling that uh, we're like children, as though we couldn't do it on our own. And everyone wants to be the first to get what they can get out of the island. Well, then, you know, you need to become an ally of the United States. And many people in Cuba don't agree with this, myself included. 
there's a long history to this also, of course. I, I see two challenges that come out of our conversation. First, what we are calling civic education, because we know that education always requires time. You cannot educate a citizen spontaneously by decree. Sure, decrees help human beings to enter in a path. And I'm guessing that the future country will have concrete legislation, modern and well thought out. The second point is we're talking about reinstitutionalizing a country that is completely controlled by the state. There are no private or independent institutions. And those that exist, as we have seen during our talks the past few days, they are immediately vulnerable to being canceled, shut down, attacked. I don't know if Convivencia has any research projects or how do you, how Rafa, how would you say from a historical point of view, how can a country that is completely controlled by the state, where all institutions and the small degree to which there is a civil society are basically extensions of state institutions and of state ideology, how could such a country engage in a transition where citizens can engage responsibly in a process of transition? towards a democracy, and on the other hand, the institutions that have to ensure that this can happen, which are all today controlled by the state, so we need to create new institutions, but this does not happen in a day. I think that there are two processes in response to your question. If you have a state that centralizes and is totalitarian or post-totalitarian, the first is a process of decentralization. So, how can we engage in a process, and I underline the word process, without falling into atomization and institutional disorder? I think uh, to balance this, there is a second process, namely a process of articulation of civil society. That is to say, we don't want to centralize, we want to decentralize, but decentralization without a process of articulation, the concept of articulation is extremely important in the modern processes of civil societies to articulate in order to produce a body that is flexible and that does not lead to a social disintegration in a process that decentralizes but where it's each one for their own which so often happens in transition processes. So how can we achieve a healthy balance between decentralization and articulation of Cuban society in a democratic system? And of course, we are not just thinking about it. In our think tank, we have published 13 research reports where we argue for a vision and we put forward plural proposals agreed with scholars in the island and the diaspora for each of our society's sectors, education, health, media, agriculture. And in each of these reports, we present both dynamics, 
for example, how to decentralize public health or education or agriculture, how to decentralize them, but also how to articulate all of the initiatives coming from civil society in order to create intermediate articulated bodies. And this is, from our point of view, the dynamic for a republic led by civil society. And especially in our second report, called Constitutional Transition, we we present 14 laws which together synergically could allow us to achieve that process of decentralization and articulation. Well, to be brief, I think that one of the reasons why it does not, it might not be a good idea to follow a liberal or neoliberal route towards transition in Cuba is because indeed there are debts, both with the foreign governments and institutions, but also there is internal debt. I mean, the word change can be understood in many different ways. So there is a period of social change without yet a change of a regime. Many people say that there is a fraudulent change because, in fact, there is. China and Vietnam. This will create further fragmentation and a few problems. One of them is pauperization and increased increase levels of poverty and inequality in Cuba. When we have a society that has more inequality and the power is even more oligarchic. Of course, during transition, the state will have to take over the responsibility of distributing social rights. So the state will have to restore basic civil and political rights, but it, it will also have to distribute social rights. It will have to recover the so-called social conquests of the revolution, which have deteriorated during the latest stage. This clearly shows that the root cannot be deregulation or a shrinking of the state. I think the million dollar question is how to build a democratic, modern country that is tyranny-proof and dictatorship 
proof. I think that the contemporary world the concert of nations is against it, but we see it happening here and there, if not absolute dictators, authoritarian figures, and authoritarian regimes with unbounded, unbounded power. So the question is, how could we combine? How, how could we overcome the disjunction between centralized leadership, which is, let's say, the traditional model, even in a, a company or any other social organization, you have a centralized leadership and then a kind of horizontal form of administration. Tanya and I have, have often talked about this. She thinks that maybe Cuba needs a kind of headless assembly around table or an assembly of the elders, sort of. It's a utopian idea of complete participation well, but it is used in African cultures and, right, so it's an idea that might work in certain countries or other primitive social organizations, but in modernity, given the situation that you forecast, maybe it could work. Maybe this would be a way of achieving a form of horizontal power and a shared leadership so that power will not be accumulated by a person. Of course, this may lead to power being accumulated by a group of people. But if the group of people is constantly changing, so it's an assembly and its constituents are constantly changing and you have historical memory within the group and it changes, that might work. Well, you are experts on this and you research this. Is there a model? for a kind of cooperative republic, a vision that is a bit more utopian socialist, where, you know, without, without falling under the model of totalitarian so, uh, real socialism, is there a model for distributing power horizontally so that it will not be centralized at the hands of a party, of a leader, horizontal and temporary? Okay, yes. <laughs> Yes, when I read this idea about a decentralized autonomous organism, I think you meant the nation, but it seems to me that now we're talking not just about the nation, but about the state. Sure, there are models in Rome and Greece. They had temporary rotating presidency. And in some countries like Mexico, during independence, under the leadership of Morelos, they introduced the triumvirate. So there were three presidents, which were six months in office and took turns during four years. Uh, Dago knows, uh, knows this very well. There is a kind of political regime within traditionally Republican democracies, which is parliamentarism. In Latin America, this has been greatly debated during the past few decades because there are political theorists like Juan Linz from Spain during the 80s and 90s, he strongly recommended that they abandon presidentialism and move towards parliamentarian regimes. So it means that the executive power is basically elected by the parliament or the Congress and not by the citizens. There are some advantages and some limitations to this. 
la mayoría de esos experimentos ultimately de uh, all similar experiments to this transition failed and what we have seen in Latin America and the Caribbean is again a strong turn towards presidentialism I still think that a semi parliamentarian model as in the 1940 constitution has many virtues that we could use. But I think that this idea, this proposal of thinking the nation as a decentralized organism, of course, these are ideas that come from anarchism and specifically socialist anarchism, as in Bakunin and Proudhon. And for example, in Spain, during the Civil War, this line of thought was extremely important. And in some Latin American countries, including Mexico, during the first half of the 20th century. As you know, during the past few years, there is a trend that is often confused in public opinion, but although it's clearly different, it's a trend that challenges the state, but not from the anarchist platform, but the libertarian platform. It's a variant, it's very powerful, very strong in the United States and some European countries. And it really, it's grounded on the Austrian school of regulation like Hayek's thought, and it aims towards a complete dismantling of the state for the sake of uh, individual interests. And then you have traditions based on the model of the assembly, beginning with the Bolshevik thought and some social democrat experiences in the 80s in Europe. And there are there's something there that could be useful. So we get into a discussion, this is what happened to Linz, because uh, you can be a failed prophet. A political theorist could come up with the perfect form of government, the one that is less costly and that yields greater benefits. And then as you put it into practice, it doesn't work. So we could sit down here and come up with some very good ideas, but I think that, you know, the way the transition develops will be determined by the people who are engaged at the time. And we will have to adjust our expectations accordingly. Although it's true that in Cuba's constitutional history, there are some things that we could um, take advantage of. The constitution of one is characteristically liberal. The one, the 1940 constitution also has a, is much more com complete in terms of political pluralism. I am really happy that we are now engaging in the exercise of forecast. And I'm very grateful to Tanya for challenging us to do this because I think that it's really a challenge that she has issued to us. There is also the experience of the cantons in Switzerland the inaccurately called African tribalism, which functions through autonomous cells, etc. I think that there is, uh, it's at first incredibly difficult to do this in the absence of civic education. How could we have a horizontal government if the people who are supposed to take temporary turns in these councils or assemblies have, have not received civic education for 70 years. In our second report, constitutional transition, we conclude that this could lead to a failed state, a nation with no governability, 
until there is an anthropological healing and civic education. And in, during the second stage in the midterm or long term, then we could think about a kind of uh, decentralized temporary structure of power. But if we don't go through a process of civic education and let's call it healing of anthropological damage, we would be placing the country on the verge of uh, having to rely on other nations to survive. I think that we could easily be annexed and this is something that I also do not want. That's the first possibility. But I do want to look further into the distinction that Rafa has made, the distinction between nation and state. He thought that when we were asked to talk about decentralization, we were talking about nation. And now we are actually talking about the decentralization of the state. Well, I think that while we are going through a civic education, and the future generations, as they go through this process of healing, we could have a hybrid model. I mean, a process of decentralization at the level of the nation, understood as the community of people. And here we should be open, as open as possible, to participation. So there would be a role for new technologies and social media because this is the modern process of assembly. I mean, nowadays, Athens is social media, or it could be if we, have, if we were educated to use it well. At the level of the nation, as much horizontality as possible, and at the level of the state, and this is why I want to build on Rafa's distinction, at the level of the state, in our second report, we at Convivencia, we propose a fully structured semi-parliamentarian regime. At the level of the state, I think that what we could achieve, we could achieve a semi-parliamentarian system because we think that to jump straight into a fully parliamentarian regime, we would be running similar risks. But a semi-parliamentarian system, similar to, although updated, to the one from the 1940 Constitution, which will have to continue being a crucial reference. But it's been a long time since 1940, so we need to update it. So at the level of the state, a semi-parliamentarian system, and at the level of the nation, horizontality, the help of new technologies and the development of civil society with a very strong process of civic education. I believe that one of the first laws that should be drafted is a reform of Cuba's system of education, and this reform should include a chapter devoted to an ethical and civic education de-ideologized. This is a, another something else that we should emphasize because we might end up having a civic education that is based on the other ideology. So this is why Convivencia published in 2014 the first textbook of civic and ethical education that is uh, deprived of 
any ideology and drafted by specialists in Cuba. Since Dr. Duduri's book, which was last published in 1958, no textbook had been published in Cuba on the topic of ethical and civic education that was deprived of ideology. And I think that this is very important from a strategic point of view. Okay, so now we've worked it all out. I love these models and I really agree. I think that it also needs to be a process of transition, not only towards democracy, but towards an understanding of power and its use. And I agree that it might at first be a hybrid model and then it may become more experimental. I think that the first thing that we might need before we create these structures is to eliminate magic religious thought in Cuba. So because people think that it's going to be, it's going to happen in an instant, we will be happy in a flash and by magic. This is something that Cuba's regime has done. Citizens and the population have no control over their fate, and so they leave it, leave it all up to mystical imagination. A mystical entity will work it out. And everyone sees salvation in a mystical entity. It's also a lack of social responsibility, responsibility. A citizenship that has no social responsibility is always expecting someone else to solve their problems. The Deus Ex Machina of Greek drama. This is why I distinguish between the concept of the supreme leader and of the Messiah. The supreme leader is secular, but the Messiah is a supreme leader with a mystical with the mystical and messianic, pseudo-messianic, of course, inflections. In Cuba, we have a messianism. The question that I would leave out of any debate is who is the one who could be president? You know, there is constantly a discussion. Who do you think would be the candidate to be president? Instead of asking this, we should, we should be saying which would be the programs, the visions, the models, the structures. I mean, my hope is that Cuba will be a few days ago at Convivencia. We were asking people, who is the, what is the name of the prime minister of Norway, of Finland? Nobody knows their name. What is the name of Venezuela's, Nicaragua's president, the president, and then everyone knows their names. I hope that one day in Cuba, you will ask, we're proposing that it be a semi-parliamentarian system, and we will ask, who is the prime minister of Cuba? Oh, I'm not sure who that is. I don't remember. Yes, this great, this great person who is the manager, and that's the ideal. Well, we're also of course, this great figure can be a woman just as well as a man. Who can be excellent administrators. Something that, of course, through Fidel Castro, we began to imagine Cuba as a continent. We should start to understand it as an island with its specific features and potentialities. And it doesn't mean that it cannot be at the vanguard. But, you know, thinking Cuba as this continent that will change the history of the world it would be helpful to see ourselves as universal beings and to, as, as you said, the 1940 constitution 
Thanks to that constitution, Cuba was a bit of a vanguard, and in 1959, it was also in the vanguard. Well, how could we use these new mechanisms to, again, be a vanguard? Maybe because I'm an artist, I think that this is important. Right. Uh, how long did were they without a president in Brussels? Maybe we could do it that do the same at some point. Well, this has been an amazing conversation. We will have to resume it soon. I don't know if someone in the audience has a question. Otherwise, I think that this has been a great conversation, and I think that we should all listen to the recording again, and I think in the future it will be an important source when we try to engage in concrete political activity, because it was we dealt with the topics that are sometimes regarded as taboo in processes of transition and social reconstruction. I forgot to say something. We were talking about parliamentarism, etc. I think that we should bear in mind that in Cuba, an ideology has always been regarded as the ideology that will solve it all. It might be right wing, it might be left wing. Right now you have the ideology of the regime and the ideology of the opposition. But I think that the future Cuba should consider all forms of thought because a society can only be whole and fully functional when you have maybe one ideology that can solve one problem and then another ideology or form of thought that has allowed you to work out another problem. Maybe one ideology can allow you to work out the economy, but another one can allow you to work out social issues. So we don't want to make a spin and go from being leftist to be to going to be going over to the right. Yes, it's extremely important. I think that one of the great challenges that we face is that I always say that it's very easy to favor democracy when your party wins. But the difficult thing is to support democracy when the other party wins. Often people govern in a way that is not inclusive because you know, a nation is built out of opposing factors. So how can you include both values and bring them into unity by an imaginary that transcends them. I think that Cuba is now entrenched in certain national values and it leaves other national values out. Like, for example, the dominant values in our national history. For example, are perhaps uh, based on male dominance. As you have said, during the past 70 years, one particular legacy has been emphasized. You have Guy Perez de Cisneros, a Cuban person who was there, who spoke when the United Nations drafted the Bill of Human Rights, and this is part of Cuba's legacy, and this is left out of our legacy. So we also need a historical review to know where we're coming from, not only after 1959, and to recover this humanist legacy or these uh, traditions of political thought that come from before. Well, I wanted to conclude we have been engaged in an exercise of intellectual speculation. And as Rafa said, you can speculate, speculate as much as you want, but then you might crash against reality. 
Eh, yo quería cerrar un poco como esto está Instar. La, Since eh, Instar is sponsoring this series of pues, talks, eh, I wanted to conclude by no talking about art. Estética, We know that ética, art has an ethical and political dimension. Eh, especially artivism. Can art be a tool eh, used to design or perfect de models, models of governance de in society? Is it important? Well, the Prime Minister of Norway is called Jonas Gar Stor. <laughs> Undoubtedly, art is important. What has been happening in the visual arts, but also we could say in literature in Cuba during the last couple of decades, this proves that art records multiple experiences and subjectivities and that it reflects a level of representation of a country's cultural and civil plurality. We talked, we have said that it is important to challenge a state ideology without doing a nation's ideological heterogeneity. I think this is important. What is unique about Cuba's regime and the old Soviet regimes is that its constitution defines the state's ideology. The 2019 constitution says that the ideology of the Cuban state is Martinian, Marxist, Leninist, and Fidelist. This is the definition of a state ideology. This is the first thing that we need to do away with. There cannot be a state ideology in a democratic framework. But it is a symptom of a nation's health to have ideological diversity. And this is reflected in political representation and in artistic representation. I think the Cuban arts within and outside the island are way over the false distinction between art and politics. Right, there was a period of, uh, uh, where there was a return to a kind of aesthetic purism, but now we are again returning to a form of understanding art that is common to global societies where art is understood as a field for civic uh, participation. And I think that Tania Bruguera's work and Instar's work is exemplary in that regard. Yes, and this present event is an example. Here, Instar has created a kind of parallel nation, a kind of micro nation. We have had discussions about all of the issues that concern us. We have had public, independent publications. We have discussed issues, extremely important issues in an installation in the context of an art event in Castle. Dago, you talked about beauty and ethics before. Do you want to add something? Yes, I have what is now called the conceptual map. If we have an idea, if we are talking about a process from ideology to humanism, within humanism, you have the cultivation of sensibility, emotion, and the perception of beauty and the creation of beauty. And so here we find art. Art is poiesis, creativity, genesis. And I believe that the future of Cuba will have to, we will have, will require extreme creativity or it will not be possible. So art as the school, as the poiesis of the new, as the creation of the new, much like literature, 
will educate the creativity that Cuba needs in order to reinvent itself and renew itself to create not only a new model, but a new understanding, a creative, poetic understanding of politics, a creative understanding of politics. So this is why art is so important. If you don't have creativity, art and beauty, you will remain within the exhaustion of ideology. What truly will bloom is art, the art of politics, the art of beauty, the art of the search for truth, and especially the art of coexistence among different people. It's interesting because all of your projects, Dago, have always valued culture enormously. When you were formerly you were president of the Catholic Commission for Culture, and all of your projects have always acknowledged the importance of culture, art, and literature. Always hand in hand, you would. You did a lot of work to rescue cultural and historical memory as well, and this is important. If we are going to create responsible individuals who have uh, a civic culture and a civic vision, individuals who know their history. Each of the issues of the journal Vitral and each of the 88 issues of our second journal, Convivencia, has a section devoted to a Cuban artist. And this is not ornamental. Using art as a tool, that's fine, but this is not how we understand art. It is one thing to instrumentalize art, it is something else to place art, creation, what used to be called poiesis, to understand it as the source of a new life. As a fountain that we find in Cuba's highlands, it's an art that comes from the ground. It's a, a water source where you are right by the ground, but the water is crystal clear. It can purify and it produces rivers and leads to the plenitude of the sea. So it's not just, just about poetic imagery, it's about political dynamics. Well, art is a prefiguration of reality. This is how we understand it. And we also regard art as a space for rehe rehearsing reality. You know that you can try things out without dealing with all of the consequences, but you can see whether it works or not and how you feel about it. And later on, you can use the knowledge acquired to enact it in reality. I think we can end here. I am truly grateful for your participation. This has been a fantastic conversation. We're extremely grateful for your generosity in accepting our invitation and uh, joining this conversation. As I said, I hope that we will be able to return to this conversation and develop some of the thoughts so that we may reconstruct, rebuild our country. Light and progress for Pinal del Rio, Lago. Thank you, Rafa. I am really grateful. It's been an honor for me. Thank you very much.
Thank you.